Namaste. Today we have a very special occasion. Uh, we have a group of souls, a group of souls that are taking discipleship today. And uh, we are welcome, welcoming them to the Ananda spiritual family discipleship uh, of the line of masters of self-realization. And uh, the subject of discipleship is a, an essential subject. If you want to know God, you need a guru. And if you are blessed to receive the commitment of a guru, you are guaranteed self-realization. If you follow the guru, if you are loyal to the guru, if you give your heart to the guru. In the purification ceremony, we, uh, representing the master, we say, uh, give your heart to me and I will enter and take charge of your life. What a statement. We are inviting the master to come into our hearts, into the totality of our consciousness and to take charge. Swamiji told so many stories uh, uh, proving that Yoganandaji could perceive the thoughts of not just one disciple or a few disciples, but all of the disciples. The master said that he went through the lives of every disciple every day. He said, to those who think me near, I will be near. Discipleship is about thinking the master being near all the time. Of course, this is not easy. The, the world's designed to distract us. We have many dilemmas in life. Should I do this? Should I do that? If we want to succeed spiritually, we have to do what Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. We have to give ourselves to God and Guru first in all circumstances. And from that center, we then live our lives. So discipleship is about committing ourselves, loyalty. Loyalty not just in, yes, I've chosen this path and I'm not wandering off to other paths, but loyalty in terms of what I give my attention to. Loyalty is saying that I choose the Lord. I choose to free myself or as come close to that freedom in this lifetime as I can through this most sacred relationship. When you're growing up and you have relationships with people, how many uh, young people are so surprised to find out that the person that they uh, think they're in a, a relationship with is thinking something completely different? How many times in life, uh, uh, even a good friend will say something that completely surprises us? Well, I didn't think you'd say that. But the, we don't know the thoughts of other people. We don't know the master's thoughts, but the master knows our thoughts. The master is a unique representative that God has sent to us to free us. That's their job. That's what they signed up to, this is good for us. Their commitment is assured, but our commitment is at risk. And the greatest gift that we have received in the spiritual family is that family itself, is that group energy, that group support. That environment that reminds us, supports us, protects us, encourages us, inspires us. This spiritual family, imagine, remember what it was like when you didn't have any place to go on Sunday. <laughs> You didn't have any place to go. You didn't have people who were thinking the way you were thinking. They're thinking other things. God bless them, let them. But we need to think with people who are thinking and hearting what we, what our souls crave. 
Now there's another element to this that I want to explore a little bit. And uh, in order to get that going, I'd like to uh, show a, a clip of Swami Kriyananda. What is my definition of discipleship? It isn't sitting around talking about the guru so much, and yet I have to say that in all these 50 years I've spent a great deal of my time meditating on Master, on what he did, on what he said, trying to understand uh, what he said and did more deeply. Uh, it's been sort of the focal point of my entire life. But at the same time, discipleship means, I think, something more. And in this, Master encouraged me, because, you know, I remember back in 1950, Master told me, uh, your work is writing and lecturing. And I, I, I said, but sir, hasn't everything been written that needs to be written? And he looked a little shocked. He said, don't say that. He said, much more is needed. And in fact, this is the role of a disciple, not to be a parent, not to be a, a record player, just repeating the words of the guru without understanding what those words are, but trying to go deep into them, trying to understand them more deeply, and then also trying to um, enlarge on that understanding, trying to show how uh, what he did is relevant. And this is, to me, the amazing thing. In a way, I really am just a parent. Not, not an unthinking parent, I hope, but somebody who I'm not trying to create. I haven't created anything new. Everything I've done has been a spin-off, so to speak, from what Master gave us. And the more deeply I've gone into his work, the more I've just been amazed at how extensive his mission is. Its potential, far more than any other teacher, and although I have not meditated on their teachings to the extent that I have on his, obviously, nonetheless, I, I've had to refer what he said to what they said to see if I've understood well, living in a vacuum, thinking in a vacuum. Um, you don't get as clear a picture as if you see that have I understood it? Is, it? is it something? Because he'd never contradict what other great masters have said. And therefore, if they all agree, you can be more confident that you've understood that if it looks as if one is saying one thing and the other is saying something quite different. So I've been aware of what other people have taught, but I have not encountered ever, anywhere, even in history, any teacher or teaching that is so broad in its scope, in its potential for changing an entire era. Most of them talk about the individual, about going into your own self. This, of course, is what the path is really all about. But he gave me another mission. I haven't been able, and in fact, I, I remember uh, Brother Bhaktananda used to be quite uh, envious of my creativity. The funny thing is that I was envious of his lack of creativity. I was envious of his being able to be a humble devotee who just thought of God and loved God and didn't think in terms of uh, broad vistas of meaning, which I was cursed with by my own nature in a way. I could not be. Otherwise, when some of the people in SRF, SRF used to speak of this as being ego, I don't know. All I can say is I had no choice. My interest lay that way. My absorption lay that way. I could only go, and it would have taken a great deal more effort on the part of this ego to suppress that than to flow with it. But the the thing that has come out of it has nothing to do with me, has nothing to do with my abilities or my talents. Rather, even in those, quote, uh, so-called abilities and talents, I found that by tuning into him, suddenly I uh, was able to do things that I could never do, often in music, for example, because I haven't had training as a composer. Yes, I studied piano for years. I 
uh, I don't know how good I was. I don't think I was particularly good, but I wasn't particularly bad. So let's say sort of uh, super mediocre. And uh, uh, when I was writing music, uh, afterwards I would think, how on earth did I do that? I don't understand. I don't know where those chords came from. I don't know chords. I don't know what the names of the chords I write are. I don't know anything about chord progression. But when I tune in to him, and when I say, well, it's got to be so, therefore it is, suddenly I do know. And it's not at all that I'm just beating around in the dark. I know exactly what I'm doing. The greatest musical expert in the world could challenge me, and I'd stand up for what I've done, because I know it's right. After it's over, I don't know how the heck I ever knew. And the same is true, I think, for just about everything. I give a talk, and I have no idea what I said afterwards, because I just sort of give it back to God. But it's not my talent, you see. It's something that uh, I have put myself in tune with Master, and not only asked his spirit to do it, but also been absolutely fascinated by the extraordinary scope of that spirit, by the extraordinary scope of his glimpse, his understanding of the needs of this particular age. Now, what he taught today wouldn't have been true 200 years ago, wouldn't have been true in the time of Shankaracharya. It was right for now. And it was absolutely right. That's why I say he is the avatar for Dwapara Yuga, at least for this beginning part of Dwapara Yuga. And we all enter into that. So as uh, Swamiji said, at its core, the spiritual life is each soul's individual journey back to omnipresent spirit consciousness. But we have incarnated in this place at this time with this family. And every family has its own flavor, its own style, its own purpose, its own unique expression. If you see a forest of uh, pine trees, it's a pine forest. If you see a forest of some other kind of tree, uh, uh, banyan trees, then it's, it's a banyan forest. And it, it's a forest but it has a different feel, it has a different expression. And this family at this time has, uh, as, a, as a part of its expression, this understanding that we are not, that we are not supposed to, well, let me say it this way, that as we tune into what it is that, that God is trying to do through this incarnation at this time, through that attunement, we will be inspired and supported in expressing our connection to spirit in the life that we've been given to live. And that this is a part of our teaching. So if you are inspired to be a physician, if you're inspired to be an architect, or if you're inspired to serve the work as, as a teacher, or, or even uh, uh, as a, a humble uh, janitor, <laughs> uh, a person who cooks the meals. Every position should be an expression of our discipleship. Brother Lawrence, he washed the dishes. He was a great saint, and uh, they had him washing the dishes. It took them quite some time to figure out what they had there, and then they tried to hide him. Because it's embarrassing to the church to find out that some of the equally blessed are more blessed than the other equally blessed. <laughs> they couldn't get used to that. They wanted to think, well, everybody is equally blessed. Well, on one hand, it's true, but not everyone is able to connect to and to manifest that, uh, that potential. So we are being asked to commune with God and bring that communion into action. And as Swamiji told that story when he first started lecturing, we, we, it's not that God does it through us, or he said here, he said, we're not just being parents. 
we start by learning as a parrot does the words, but then over time we begin to go to deeper and deeper levels of understanding and living the meaning of the words. And as a part of that, as a part of sharing, one of the things you learn about uh, sharing with others is that if you can't explain it, you don't understand it. And the better you are at explaining it, the better you understand it. And it's not you, it's spirit. So I see oftentimes people in the name of humility are unwilling to stand up and, and, and um, or they're afraid to or hesitant to stand up and say, I'm representing. If you study the way Swamiji teaches, so here, this was in the late 90s, this uh, video, but he'd been teaching since uh, uh, the 50s, early 50s, maybe even late 40s. He probably by 49, he was already uh, lecturing. After, I mean, he was one of the great speakers on the planet on the yoga teachings, but he wasn't like self-important. He was just like him. <laughs> it's just him, but such a good, beautiful version of him. You see what I'm saying? Don't be afraid to be you, uh, that, but be the highest you. In other words, uh, 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 Swamiji, in attunement to master, his inner connection became more and more refined in that vibration, but he was still Swami Kriyananda Yogananda. He wasn't... He didn't somehow become Yogananda Yogananda. He was Swami Kriyananda Yogananda. So we will each become us, individualized expressions of that um, family vibration, that family expression. This is, this is what we're seeking to do in our discipleship. We are not just uh, 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 bowing down, making the offerings, and, and then done. We are integrating this into every moment and every expression and our, our purpose. What is your purpose? Align that purpose with God's vision of your life. And uh, it may take many twists and turns unexpected, but if you have the, the courage, the adventurousness, Master said uh, people are held back by their spiritual unadventurousness. Oh, I couldn't do that. Yes, you can. Each and every one of us can do so many more things than we, than we generally would believe. But most importantly, it doesn't matter if we succeed or fail outwardly. It's if we succeed inwardly in our dedication to following the light that God gives us. If we do that, we can fall fat, flat on our faces. We will have won we will have inner spiritual victory. But what we've seen over the years is that when people align themselves with the divine energy flowing through their life, they are generally going to be successful at what they're doing. And if, and if they're doing something that they're not supposed to be successful with outwardly, they will learn the lessons that they're supposed to learn from that <coughs> opportunity. And then in it, you, they will see the success in a completely different light, because remember that true success in life is living in tune with and uh, and and expanding our awareness of God and Guru's presence in our lives. This is the only measure of success in life. Every other outward success is they're just toys. Toys are fragile. Toys are broken, they're lost, they're stolen, they're temporary. The uh, success of the soul is ultimately eternal and omnipresent bliss. There is no other true purpose in life. 